Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the podcast version of Trade Variety Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. officially start now. Hello, everybody. My name is Trey. Thank you for coming. Thank you for tuning in regularly to our Monday night show. Uh, tonight's a great one. We're talking about personal photography projects. We have all kinds of interesting people on here, people you may not know, uh, people you should know, and you'll find out all kinds of cool stuff this evening. Um, as usual, we'll have a nice uh, discussion and, and uh, talk about what people are up to. Um, and at the end of the show, we end with uh, like photographer discoveries that we found on Google+. That's the normal turn of events. So we always begin with introductions. Uh, we'll begin with introductions right now. We'll just kind of go left to right. We'll start with um, Dallas Nagata White and her husband, Ed, who I had the pleasure of meeting um, out in Hawaii. Uh, we actually spent a, a few days with Dallas, uh, Tom Anderson and I. Uh, she jumped in our car and went all around. We had a film crew with us. Uh, we did all kinds of stuff together, uh, which is being edited together right now for publication of future days. Very secret, but very awesome. I can't wait for that to be finished. Uh, but anyway, Dallas, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us about your website. And, and like everyone else, plug whatever you want to plug here in the intro part. Okay. Um, well, hi, I'm Dallas. Um, I'm a photographer. Um, I kind of do everything with photography. So I would say, I say I'm an everything photographer because I shoot everything from landscapes to fashion, photojournalism, art, like everything in between. Um, and this is my husband, Ed, and he is my on-hand second shooter, lighting tech, everything, Sherpa. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pipes uh, so yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of between websites right now. Like I have them, but nothing that I really like to share with people because they're really outdated. But hopefully that's my summer project. That's not to white.com. Revamping my, <laughs> my web persona, I should say. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, Dallas. Um, next is uh, Ron Brinkman. Hello, Ron. Hello. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Good to be here. Um, I don't know. Some people might know me from the This Week in Photography podcast, which I'm on quite a bit. But um, in terms of my sort of photo life, I guess I'm I'm certainly a lot more of a hobbyist than anything. My my professional photography stuff tends to relate to the work I've done in the visual effects world, where I worked on a lot of movies doing visual effects. You kind of have to know your way around a camera. But these days, uh, I'm either doing software related stuff or uh, uh, in this case, working on my own app. I worked at Apple for a little while too on their Aperture product, so kind of all over the place. Oh, cool. All right, I'm happy to have you here, Ron, and I can't wait for people to see your new app, which we'll get to shortly. Yes, I will. I will happily start pimping it whenever it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, all right, Scott Cublin, what's up? Hello, everyone. I am Scott Cublin. I've uh, been shooting uh, pictures for maybe three years, mostly landscapes. I learned most of it from Mr. Ratcliffe. And I have a website, hdrphotographyblog.com, that I rarely update. So the best way to see the new stuff is through Google+. Plus. So just look for me on Google+, Plus. Scott Cublin, K-U-B-L-I-N. Put a lot of stuff out there. I show some before and after stuff, and I talk about how I accomplished the shots that I accomplished. Oh, and I own a prime lens too, so I guess I'm also a people uh, portrait photographer too, because that's the requirement now, right? <laughs> Is that the rule? <laughs> yeah. If you own a prime pretty lens, much, pretty much. A, perfect. <laughs> All right, I just got my first um, 1.2 lens. I got a, nice. uh, a Leica 1.2. Nice. Nice. I've always been jealous of all these Canon people with their with their 1.2, being a Nikon guy, I can go below 1.4, so I'm, I'm all excited. It's nice well, that's to probably expensive, too. Yeah. <laughs> and that's probably nothing to the gear that Todd Sisson from New Zealand 
Yeah. Todd, uh, tell us all about you and your background. Well, and sort of thing. Sure thing. Yeah, I'm Todd Sisson from uh, down in New Zealand, as Trajan said. I did feel good about myself about five minutes ago, because well, about five seconds ago, because I just recently bought a 1.485 mil prime, but uh, that throws up the stage me, so <laughs> no. I feel I feel decidedly average. So anyway, uh, I do mainly landscape work. I, my background is a uh, oh, long story, but uh, originally shooting film back in the day and uh, doing that commercially, then about seven years ago, I went full-time landscape uh, with my wife. And our website is sisson.co.nz. Uh, like Dallas, it's very much uh, in transition at the moment. That's where I've been for the past couple of months, basically rebuilding the monster. So uh, uh, that should launch in the next couple of months. But uh, yeah, I'll show you some of my work later on. And uh, yeah, we'll see, see what you think of it. You know, I'm actually fascinated by all these husband-wife photography teams. We, let's do it. Mark this down, Dave. I want to do a future show on this because Dallas and Ed are a team. <laughs> Todd and his wife are a team. Verena and Jay Patel are a team. Shirley Lowe and Charles Liu are a team. It's strange they have different vowels on the end of their last name. But anyway, they. this is an interesting phenomenon to me. I can't imagine... Uh, running a photography. <laughs> <laughs> it's inconceivable. I don't know. But it, we'll have a, like a whole relationship show coming up. That's so, so incredibly that's accurate way. Of, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a very accurate way of finding out where the where the line between divorce and marriage is. I can assure you. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Trey, I take it Tina's not nearby right now. No. <laughs> no. Uh, she's, she's very busy. Um, she stuff. Okay, so, um, Marina, you're one half of a, of a, a duo. Tell us about you. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm Verena Patel. Um, my website is uh, photographybyverena.com. Um, I've been shooting for, uh, I think, about 22 years. Um, and uh, I've been working with Photoshop for maybe 18. Um, I, uh, my husband and I have taught workshops in national parks all across the United States, um, and we have ebooks and webinars that we um, collaborate on and, you know, that are available on our websites, and we have one with Stuck in Customs right now. We're just seeing if, you know, they're worth their salt. They can do anything for us. <laughs> yes, I'll go ahead. And, uh, We're not convinced, Trey. No. <laughs> well, don't worry. You, you'll, be, you'll be convinced. We have, let me go ahead and share my screen. I'll, I'll plug your book for you. Ooh, thank so you. We're on, on, on flatbooks.com. Let me mm -hmm. share my screen. Screen share, then go over here. Um, this is their book. It's called What the Heck is a Histogram? <laughs> and Ooh, I, I really, you know, I've really given Jay and Verena a hard time about <laughs> their book cover for this. I think it's awful. You know, <laughs> yes. I think you yes. know, it, it's a good topic, right? And so here's the thing about um, about these guys is that Jay and Verena take some of the most beautiful photos I've ever seen in my life, and I'm very, very serious. Thank you. And wow. so I don't know why they they're not putting them <laughs> on the covers of their. You know, who cares? You know, I mean, it's a beautiful <laughs> photo. And Actually, like, Trey, normally we do put them on the cover. Um, this time, it, it was a lapse of judgment, if you will. It, it was my, uh, my, you know, stretching the, the rules cover. And, um, you know, how it goes. You win some, you lose some. Yeah. Okay, well, it's not too late to change the cover. We are actually working on a new cover, and and I am planning to finish it tomorrow. Okay. Well, it, it's actually it's a great book, uh, despite the lackluster cover. So don't maybe. feel bad. Trey tells me all the time he doesn't like my stuff. So. I, it's all good. I can take it. I tell Trey, you know, that I don't like his stuff. So yeah, okay. you say it was such vitriol. I find it true. Oh, oh. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. we're gonna stop that conversation now before I get in trouble, and get kicked so, out. <laughs> uh, so let's say hello to the two producers here. Uh, uh, first from my corner in the red hat is Dave Veffer. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Dave Veffer. Um, I don't do much of anything, but I take pictures sometimes, and you can find my stuff at <laughs> plusdave.com. Cool. Thank you, Dave. We're all enjoying watching watching your uh, your burgeoning photography career. Well, thank you. Um, and joining us better. today from the Twit Network is not Tony Wang. Um, it's not a suddenly 
a different looking Tony Wang. It's Brian Burnett. Hello, Brian. Hey, Trey. Thanks for introducing me. Glad to be on the show or watch you guys. <laughs> Are you into photography by chance? Uh, yeah, a lot actually. And Tony has helped me a lot. Um, I got my first DSLR uh, for Christmas is T3i. All right. So you're photo curious. <laughs> yeah, getting started. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's get started with the discussion. Um, let's get to know some of these people and uh, share their work around so you can see what they're up to. And, and uh, as usual, I invite everybody to, uh, you know, give feedback or ask questions of, of one another during this discussion. Uh, let's just start it out with Todd. Um, Todd takes uh, amazing, beautiful photos. He's got New Zealand to work with, um, and that that makes uh, that makes a good start for anybody, I think. But why don't you show us some of your winners, or, or talk talk about what you do, and you know, just let us get to know this creature called Todd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, it's all on the camera in the land and uh, living in New Zealand, Trey, as you know. <laughs> uh, right, I'll try and get this uh, sc uh, screen share going. Uh, I was just going to show you a little bit about uh, what I'm doing rather than sort of, uh, uh, you know, is that up? Where, are we, uh, where yes. are we? You guys got it? We see it. So uh, I'm just going to run it out of Lightroom uh, out of, if that's okay. Um, so this is sort of the type of landscape I guess I've uh, sort of made my name, if I, if I can go that far. Uh, doing this is uh, from one, a trip I did down in February. Down at, this is Moraki Boulders. Um, and uh, this is a great example. It's very a uh, good example of sort of what I call a dynamic landscape. Lots of things, uh, leading lines and great graphical I, I, um, objects to work with. It's a pretty unique location in that respect. Uh, and then, of course, the sky pop. So this is the sort of stuff I... Uh, I do, and you know, I really enjoy this stuff. I like it, and it's a pleasure to be there seeing this, and a pleasure to capture this sort of work. Um, but uh, on this particular trip, I sort of uh, I, I feel like I'm doing a lot of the same stuff, to be honest. You know, and uh, it's I, I, I'm wanting to push it out a bit, and I, I don't know whether I'm getting anywhere at this point. But anyway, on this particular trip, I started working around uh, sort of suboptimal lighting conditions and started uh, coming out with just playing around with uh, with scenes like this where, where we're not talking with a big red sky and lots of color I guess I'm sort of known as a bit of a color guy which uh, something I, uh, a lot of my work's very colorful and the reason that I produce a lot of that is because it sells well um, without wanting to sound too uh, callous um, <laughs> and too commercial but you guys are mainly American, so you're all cool with the capitalism thing. So, um, <laughs> so, um, so I went with this one. Then, then I, I was getting a lot of stick from the guys who uh, followed me on G Plus at the time about uh, my complete and utter uh, lack of black and white work. And uh, I've got quite a few friends on G Plus who are black and white aficionados, um, and I suck at black and white. Um, it just doesn't really resonate with me. And um, I was working on this image here um, and trying to make it into a black and white. And... Uh, you know, I accidentally click, click color, and after I messed with every channel slider in Lightroom, I popped across, and something similar to this came out, which is, you know, another progression towards a, a more of a desaturated look. Again, very dynamic elements to it, and uh, it's just got that whole uh, graphical thing going on. Um, so cool, Todd. I, you know, these it is true that these black and white photographers will make us color photographers feel bad for not. Hosting black, doesn't it? It's kind of a little condescending, isn't it? I, I blow it off. It's, you know, it's, it's it more than a little condescending. It's yeah, uh, yeah. and and I, they get quite upset when I suggested if I was to do a black and white, I'd I'd have to put a chair in there or put a moody self portrait of myself in that <laughs> sense. Um, but um, yeah. Anyway, they they get they get a bit that way. I I, I find that it's just because they're they're true artists and we we uh oh, right. we, we we're messing around <laughs> with the fringes, Trey. Come on. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, the, I won't show you the black and white version. I, I, it just doesn't work for me. But uh, you know that was quite an interesting thing. And then uh, again, I st I'm out now looking for uh, for that flatter light um, where it's not popping so much. And this is up at the Blue Lake a couple of weeks ago, which is just up the road from me. And uh, this is one of uh, New Zealand's full of all these weird sort of uh, anomalies. You know the great uh, clean green New Zealand and. Uh, 
you see a scene like this and you go, oh man, what a what a place. But the reality is that's actually like a industrial wasteland. It's actually an old gold mine uh, lake that's left over from when the guys destroyed the entire valley to uh, they knocked down a hill to uh, to get the gold. But uh, anyway, it's very pretty. It makes a great photo. Are these HDR? No, well, no, I'm, I don't. I've I've never done HDR. I uh, I guess I'm a practitioner of uh, I guess you call it uh, extended dynamic range. I guess uh, these ones, but most of the, these are all out of a single exposure. So I use an ND filter a lot, and just to keep everything within within the within the histogram. As uh, as you should buy, there's an excellent book called Histogram uh, by Verena <laughs> Patel. <laughs> Lighten your snap, very very snappy I cover. Did, the cover just I don't know. It tops, doesn't it? <laughs> did I mention Sorry. this whole thing is actually a paid advertisement for uh, my ebooks? <laughs> it seems to be. When... <laughs> yeah. In fact, you didn't. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, it's a funny thing because I've made a transition. I was scared to sort of, uh, until I got to G, it was like a, sort of like a national secret with us because New Zealand's kind of backward in many ways. And, you know, we, we get like, I've been accosted by people who are so angry that you know, that I've manipulated photos in Photoshop, and I'm quite open about it if I'm asked, but, you know, they, they get quite upset about it, and it's changing a bit. And so now I think one thing G Plus has done for me is that I've uh, seen how far you can go with things and for it to be acceptable, I guess, which is a it's a bit sad that I haven't reached that conclusion myself a lot earlier, but, you know, it's good inspiration for me. Um, so uh, this next photo is a stunner. This is the first one off my D800E, off my first test shoot. Um, through uh, when I, uh, last weekend, uh, I got that. And uh, so this is a good example of, this is where I really just wanted to take uh, in those sort of really lackluster lighting conditions, see what I could do um, with a mountain of, um, of, of work in Lightroom. And so this is just trying to pull out, I read a bit about painters and and this was just done last night. It's, it's very much, a, and I don't really love the composition, but uh, just trying to, get to handle a handle on these sort of techniques of using uh, selective light which you're painting in there with Lightroom which I, I love Lightroom for that just it's, mm -hmm. it's just creative freedom for me in that respect um, hey Todd don't just, you don't you find that with Lightroom 4 I mean I know you don't you say you don't do HDR and, but with Lightroom 4 you, when you move around the lights and the darks and the shadows and that the clarity I mean it, it does it's, pretty much what the HDR algorithm does I can imagine it does. It's just all I'm saying is I don't. I've never laid multi. I, I've I know I'll, I'll pull individual images. I've never run it through an, uh, uh, an, an HDR processor. Right. Is what I'm right, saying. Right. You never so you know I'm merging. I'm, I'm merging <laughs> images, and I think yeah, definitely. Uh, you know the the tonal range. Again, I only downloaded Lightroom four about uh, three days ago, so um, it's really insane what it's doing in the uh yeah. and to some of those uh, those controls are getting more powerful by the minute aren't they they're they're, they're, they're brilliant I, I um, think, so yeah, yeah I, I mean i was going to say i think it is fair to say that you know the sort of pain of doing hdr photography these days where you have to take the multiple exposures is really just kind of a temporary thing you know as the dynamic range of these cameras gets more and more those same tools are just going to be your standard processing tools instead of that you know having that hdr moniker assigned to them even i've been saying for ages that trey is a dinosaur so yeah probably right. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was going to go with ahead of the curve but you know all right yeah, 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 perspective yeah, yeah. right yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um no it's uh uh, yeah, I think so. But, you know, I look at that camera, I, the D800E, I just can't believe. Uh, the, it's like a, I've never had a camera shifted up a camera and actually been so amazed by the results. You know, everything's been an iterative thing for me until now. I mean, it's like this giant leap in terms of the the, the image quality. It's just unreal. And the dynamic range and the so that combined with Lightroom, it's just quite it's quite scary, really. And, the, of course, that's open to anyone who can afford to buy a camera like that. So... Uh, so yeah, it's um, it's exciting times, really. Um, so that's just sort of a sketch. Now I've also been working on a another concept with my now outdated uh, eighty five one point four. Um, I've been playing with now this guy here, Ryan. You guys probably know him, Ryan Brenizer, um, uh who came up with a concept for uh, um, stitching together ultra shallow depth of field shots. Not only is he lucky enough to have um, 
thought of this idea. Uh, he's also promoted it somehow online, and he's got a name cool enough that it's now called the Brinzier effect, which uh, he's very lucky. I don't have a name that cool, uh, even if I had a thought of it. But uh, <laughs> so what, what you're looking at here is about a, crikey, um, probably about a 80 megapixel stitch. It's very rough. It's just a sketch, basically. I'm just trying this out. And so it's this one doesn't, Oh, you'd really need to see it large to understand it, but you've got a plane of focus there that's basically from the chimney and it's actually not even quite sharp enough on the building. And then everything behind it falls out and then you've got this enormous file to work with. So printing at large, it just looks amazing when you've got this, because you get that incredible separation between the, the subject matter and the background, which is something I love out of portrait photography and I can never achieve in landscape with, you know, so you're going in really close with an 85 mil at 1.4 or 1.8 or something, shooting at multiple stitches. I think that's about eight images joined together. And uh, then you get this incredible depth of field. Um, so look up, it's, if you haven't heard of it, it's, I think it's B-R-E-N-I-Z-E-R. And there's some maniacs online there who've been doing weddings with it. And like they've got the bride and groom out of insanely out of focus uh, sorry insanely crisp and then the whole background is this giant panorama and it's like 120 shots they've stitched together for a wedding i mean i'd love to pay to have paid for that bill um, <laughs> and this next one which is the last one i'll show you is another one of these and this one was taken off this weekend off the d800e again and uh it's a really i just threw it together last night just to see what it is this thing is uh, nine images stitched together, and it is um, 1.7 meters at, at 300 DPI. I think it's 17, 18,000 pixels long. So I could, I, I sort of envisaged one day being, wanting to do an exhibition of these sort of using this technique and uh, uh, just find the right subject matters and uh, stitch these massive prints together, just as something to uh, something to do for fun. What are you stitching them with? I'm just uh, I've just done that manually. I just it's, these I'm really in this sort of sketching phase for me. I'm not really I'm I'm shooting all this stuff handheld, just seeing whether I like it, getting a feel for it, and understanding what it is. And then I've just stitched that together in Photoshop, um, which is a real uh, monster of a thing to deal with once it starts getting to that full resolution. But it's just an interesting thing. I I uh, I just and and like I say, it's very hard to appreciate that. I'm going to try this. This could crash me i might this may be the end of me i'm going to try and zoom in just to give you an idea of um yeah that's probably going to spin forever um but it's uh oh the well no i did it look at that freaky um you might get an idea of the sort of resolution there through this but uh yeah so that's me anyway um yeah is that great right? well thanks todd you know i whoa now we see it yeah, yeah. <laughs> way way and that, just for your reference, for you again, North Americans, that's the equivalent of yield. Yield. So, <laughs> give yield. Yeah. <laughs> give, give way. Very, very English, old chap. <laughs> Top notch. Well, thanks, thanks for showing us this, Todd. I, uh, you know, I'm on a plane to come to New Zealand in less than 24 hours. So let's let's get together after I arrive. Sounds good. I'll give you a couple of hours to unpack. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought maybe you could come help me unpack. <laughs> yeah, have one of them barbecues. Yeah. So, uh, how about you, Dallas? Do you want to go next? Okay. Sure. Let's see. Okay. Now we're set up. Okay. Okay. So um, we're opening upon Trey's request uh, the picture I took of him and Tom when they were in Hawaii a, few, a couple months ago now. Yeah. Um, and I guess what I wanted to talk about today when it was the subject is like personal photo projects and stuff is um, I've been really trying to like let go of a lot of control in situations and making the best of what I'm presented with. And that goes for whatever I'm doing, whether it's, you know, photojournalism, landscapes, uh, fashion most recently. Um, and so this is a picture that Trey had shared where uh, a lot of people thought that I had photoshopped it or that I had like been using like a lot of fancy tricks like mirrors and then all the, the white dots in the background are stars. But all it is, is uh, Trey and Tom standing at the end of a pier 
with uh, one of my friends crouching behind them with a speed light and I had pocket wizards and it was raining and that was it. <laughs> like this is not very different from the raw shot. It was barely edited, like little contrast and toning and that's it. So, um, and that kind of like, that kind of, that kind of fits how, you know, our thesis of photography, we try, we try very little, well, actually we don't composite shots at all, really. Like we, we may do some minor retouching, but most of the time what we try to do is that if it's, if it's in the frame, that's what we use. That's kind of why it's also important to us to shoot in raw photography, because like, uh, like Todd was saying earlier, you know, just, there's so much data there. So you're able to pull out stuff that, well, we can't perceive it. And while it seems like uh, the camera may have not seen it, um, once you once you put it into a program that's actually able to edit it, you're able to pull out just an incredible amount of, of detail uh, and color. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to say, there's also a front fill light on this shot too. Yeah. Yes. Which Ed was holding. Um, so yeah, and I guess that leads into what I call um, the best picture I've ever taken thus far in my life. Because I just wanted to put that out there, which was this one. Nice. And basically used... That is not uh, me and Tom. That is not me and Tom. No, um, <laughs> this is actually on a trip that we took um, about a month ago to um, the Big Island of Hawaii. And we hiked out eight miles to the active lava field. And my whole plan had been to do long exposure shots, like possibly HDR of the lava with the stars above. But of course, once we got there, it was pretty much pouring down rain. So um, we're like, well, we hiked all the way out here and we have time. So we're just going to sit here and wait for the rain to stop. But then we're like, well, we might as well be shooting. Um, so for this one, again, it was just uh, a speed light pocket wizard. My camera was on a tripod and I set up the shot and had another friend who was hiking with us uh, push the shutter button. And yeah, and again, people like think like, oh, it's photoshopped. You added the texture in and stuff. And I'm like, no, that's rain. I'm way too lazy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. so yeah, and so I just uh, wanted to show this because this was the last landscape I did. Actually, after uh, uh, meeting Trey and I was super inspired to start shooting landscapes uh, more than I had been. So I spent about the next two months like, you know, driving around and making an effort to shoot landscapes. But then actually in the last couple of weeks, um, it's been all fashion shoots, like five fashion shoots. So um, hey, these were like the hey, last Dallas, landscape. I, um, hmm? I want to ask you real quick before you, before you go on about this, you know how, like that picture that of Tom and I in this one, and I didn't tell people how you did it. You know, I wanted to wait 24 hours and have people guess. And I, saw, I guess you saw the same reaction to this, but what, and you, you see a lot of this because you're, you're popular, um, but people speculate, right? And they're very, very sure that what they're saying is right. And they're, they're uh, um, you know, and the way they say it is actually incredibly annoying, right? Like they got it all figured out. Um, how do you respond artistically to this? Does it, does it bother you that uh, people out there are just being so nonsensical and so sure of themselves? I usually just show them the raw file. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, we, we tend to put we tend to put our, our money where our mouth is. Really, I mean, like to be to be fair, all these people um, are very certain about X, Y, or Z. But um, you know, w the suggestions that they're making could probably produce similar effects. Like, could somebody Photoshop this picture? Yes. You know, could set. Possibly, you know, like somebody really talented, you know, a digital artist. Uh, in the case uh, of you guys, could somebody have set up a, um, a strobe and a mirror behind behind you guys and like put up, um, what's it called, Christmas lights? Yes. Would it, would it produce a similar effect? Maybe. So, you know, people people have their ways that they try to go about uh, about, you know, producing their effects. We just happen to... I guess collaborate with nature itself, and you know, try to be as raw a photographer as possible. So, I think that's I think that's the gracious answer. <laughs> well, I, I personally think both approaches are equally as valid. I, I admire people who can take something and create a you know create a vision like that out of Photoshop. I it would just never happen with me. I just don't have the skill set. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I'm the same. I try to shoot more. In the moments myself, but yeah, yeah, 
yeah, it's definitely not nothing against anybody who does composite or um, mm -hmm. create these digital artworks. I'm just, like I said, too lazy and yeah. too sloppy about it. Like there's been occasions where I've tried because uh, the occasion called for it, but it just didn't work out that great. So yeah. I do try to get as much in camera as I can. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, and then here's just my default landscape shot I decided to throw in here for Trey. Be like, here's a landscape. <laughs> this is when the rain finally cleared up. Yeah. So, um, so actually got like stars it. in the moon and figured out um, I have dust in my, I have, a, I was using a 16 to 35 lens that I had bought used in here. Turns out there was a lot of dust in between the elements because I was getting lens flares like from the lava and almost all my shots. So it was pretty bad. By, by the way, we would like to, to say that um, it is not legal for you as, you know, for like the audience out there, it is not legal for you to just go trouncing about looking for lava on the Big Island. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very dangerous, um, but you can, like you can't, there are uh, tour groups that will take you and they have the necessary legal um, provisions Put into place the legal exceptions they've coordinated with the state they've coordinated with private property owners uh, on the path to the lava in order to uh, take people out so if you want to go uh, you can look up those tour groups but I definitely caution you against like trying to do it alone because as I said there were times where you know you're walking and you can't tell what is fresh lava especially when you're walking around with a flashlight you can't tell what's fresh lava and what's uh, old flows. So well, won't the fresh lava be really hot? Um, <laughs> You'll know quick. Like, <laughs> like if you can't tell that it's fresh lava, then then it's going to be hot, but it's going to be kind of like a general heat. So it wouldn't be too. I I could see somebody stepping on a fresh flow, and then it breaks open, and then all the heat leaks out, and you're you know in big trouble at that point. Because yeah, like like for these, we were able to get within five feet, and it it, it wasn't too hot at all. And it was just general diffuse heat. Later on, we came to a lava river, which was open lava, and that was very hot. So again, it's just it's a dangerous proposition to go alone. But it's really cool. It was really cool. <laughs> so if you ever have an opportunity, we recommend it as long as you do it sensibly. So yeah, um, so yeah. Um, okay, so I guess switching gears. Um, yeah, in the last couple of weeks, I've done what five or six fashion shoots, which yeah. is a lot for me. Um, and basically, what I've been re really pushing myself personally to do is one, not be too worried about having optimal conditions and like doing stuff like shooting in bright light, um, and also trying to find new locations. Because on Oahu, I mean, it's not that big of an island, so it tend to all shoot in the same places that look fashion-y, right? So I've been really pushing myself to find new locations, um, even in just the smallest places. Or use old locations in new ways. Or use old locations in new ways, yeah. So um, like this one, um, you know, is diff was different for me because one, it's really harsh lighting. Um, you know, like she has a highlight on her, her far cheek, uh, which, you know, normally would bother me, but I'm trying to learn to love imperfections because you can open any magazine and look at Vogue or whatever. And there's like high fashion pictures and you know, the model does have awkward highlights or shadows on her face, but for some reason it's okay because I didn't take that picture. Um, mm. cause I, I get, I get hung up on details like that. So I've been really trying to loosen up with my, my shooting and not direct as much and just, uh, see what I can make out of it. Um, Okay. She actually looks like she has a number one on her shoulder. Oh, yeah. Do you see it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, um, someone on Google Plus had also pointed out recently that, like, I, I often have um, my models looking off frame at the edge, which is, a, like, a breaking the rules, I guess. But I've been doing that a lot, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. Break the rules. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the rules are yours to break. Yeah. Exactly. Like, experience, experience is mostly like knowing knowing what rules to break when. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I'd say that that's kind of like the mark of a of a more experienced photographer when they're able to just break the rules and make it make it work and make it look good. Okay. So for our next shot, um, this is a shoot we did where okay, like this light was perfect. 
I mean, I, I couldn't ask for a better like golden backlight atmosphere with like the faded out background and like those, those dark spots uh, are palm trees. Um, but what I wanted to show with this picture compared to the next one, it was probably a difference of like 10 minutes. And again, it, it was about um, making the best of what light we had, like clouds are rolling in and the, it was gonna, sun was gonna go down behind a ridge. So we had very limited time here. Um, so just 10 minutes later, um, this was what the light looked like and like making a completely different image. And yeah, so again, it's just working with the environment. Like um, we often say that we're collaborating uh, with the environment yeah. for our pictures because we don't shoot studio almost ever. Yeah. So it's all about working outside and what light we have. Yeah, kind of like being able to see what nature itself is giving you and say, I can do this with what you're giving me. So it's, you know, it's kind of a collaboration, kind of like a, almost a philosophical statement. And do you guys work in with a, a couple of stylists? Because I've found in my experience, they make a huge difference to, to the outcomes of a shoot. Yes, uh, makeup artist um, slash hairstylist and um, in fact, one of our wardrobe favorite, stylist. In fact, one of our favorite wardrobe stylists is watching us right now. So <laughs> a shout out to Tyson <laughs> Joins. Hi, Tyson. Hi, Tyson. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> Go, Tyson. He, he, makes us, he, makes, he makes our photos look much better. Yeah. And yeah. And actually, okay, that'll bring me to what else, another one I wanted to shoot. Um, another thing we try to do is we try to make it not look like Hawaii because there's definitely a saturation in the market of like girls on the white sand beaches and bikinis. Um, so we're often trying to make everything look like somewhere else. So here's one we did with Tyson recently where we were going for a more upscale um, look. And again, this is this is natural lighting uh, with a reflector coming from the left to fill in the shadows a little bit. And I was basically just having the model walk back and forth and trying to find those moments where it isn't posed, like it's completely natural. Again, trying to let go. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask something. Since uh, Trey, you just came from the Caribbean, does this read Caribbean to you or? Well, I think it it seems sort of Caribbean. Why was that the point of it? Well, we were trying not to not make it uh, look very much like Hawaii, so we were like, "Oh, this looks, this looks like the Keys." So, <laughs> so we were just like, "Oh, is this?" So we were wondering. Yeah, we were wondering it does. Well, it looks. I would say it looks kind of more, uh, you know, uh, the coast of the Mediterranean, like uh, you that know, the south of the Marlo. I wouldn't have thought that it looked like Hawaii at all. Yeah, it doesn't look like. I agree. It. Oh, so, okay, mission success. Um, and actually, another picture from this shoot goes back to what we were talking about with um, black, black and white, and white. <laughs> versus color. Um, okay, because for, for me, um, black and white is easy for me. Um, I don't know if it's because I did start with black and white darkroom photography, but I'm actually way more comfortable with black and white than color. Um, and in this case, when I first edited this image, I did the black and white because it was already really late golden light and it was you know, I was doing things with skin tones and stuff. So I was just like, okay, you know, I'm just going to go black and white. It's contrasty. The outfit's almost monochromatic, so it's okay. And we were going for a high fashion look, which is typically black and white as well. Um, but then um, my, my stylist, again, he's like, oh, what about color? And I was like, oh, but I've already done, you know, I finished the image. Um, but, you know, I, I actually personally needed that push to like, I guess, go go be brave and like go into the color, especially because um, the bag he chose, you, you see over here, it did have like a color detail to it. Um, so that's another example of, I guess, my personal project of pushing myself to like out of comfort areas. And um, I, I actually think the color image came off more mature. Yeah, and it's a, and also a good example of collaboration with other artists and things that maybe other people that you're working with are looking for. So, um, and also I, I did want to point out, kind of like going back to that black and white discussion, um, like for us at least, we believe that black and white and color have kind of like different uses that are, that overlap but can also be mutually exclusive. Like if you want to create a more high contrast, you know, uh, more graphic look, for example, you know, you go with black and white, you know, if you, um, you know, just color, I don't think that color and black and white are really sort of like, um, like you would say one is better than the other. They just, they're just tools in your toolbox that you can use for different feels and different moments. 
Hey, uh, Ed and Dallas, let me interrupt you guys for a minute. Hold that thought. I want to go to uh, Todd because Todd has got to go away, yes. sadly. I have a four-year-old little girl waiting for me. Yeah, so it's we like one of those. Right. Sounds also, like a world vision ad, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, so, it, but you have a, a, a Google Plus photographer discovery you wanted to share with us before you leave, and I want to make sure we, we get to that. Oh, yeah. I had a couple of those, actually, yeah. Um, but I'll just do one. Um, I'm gonna, I'll pick, I had three, so we'll go with uh, Liam here. I don't know whether you guys have covered them off enough, uh, covered them off previously, but we'll... Uh, um, We'll give it a go. It doesn't seem to be that well followed, so um, see when that pops up. Yes. Ta -da. So this is uh, Liam Frankland. I'll, I'll pronounce that overly well, just so as, uh, you can look him up. And uh, I thought he was from San Francisco, but I believe he's actually a POM, which uh, is a, an English person, is what we call him over here in New Zealand. Um, and uh, he's, I just love his work. He's uh, I don't know. Some very few photography uh, photographers who I sort of stumble across their work, and it gives me a vibe. I guess gives me a feel, and I, for him, I just get a lovely feel off it. I, it sparks something emotionally with me, you know. Um, so that's uh, this would be one of my favourite ones. It's uh, I just love his use of blur, and he, a lot of the time he's shooting on a very narrow aperture, very uh, wide open on a one on a 1.4 or 1.8 by the looks of it. Um, <clears throat> this image here. I just I love it. I've got a very similar shot myself of some uh, uh, umbrellas in, in Portugal on slide somewhere, and I, that one I think resonates with me for that same reason. I just love the the simplicity of that shot, and it's kind of quirky. That there looks like it's been done in a studio. It's like some guy set up a. Um, if you go and look at that on a stream, it's like someone's gone and plonked that down and done a, done it digitally, but it, I'm pretty sure it's not. It's just uh, it's just stunning, just the light on it and the treatment of how he's handled everything and the placement of the subjects for me is absolutely gorgeous. And uh, finally, um, just again, sim simplicity and vibe, baby. It's got a good feel to it. Um, yeah, it's just stuff that makes me want to go out and take shots like that. Oh, so, amazing! Yeah, that's, Thank that's, you. That's that's why I love this segment of the show because I I may not have found that guy on my own, but he's awesome. Yeah, well, look, look, if you've followed me, Trey, you would have. But you know, he's, <laughs> I keep pimping him every every couple of weeks. But you know, <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, that that's Liam Franklin, folks. And uh, I have to run. The little girl is waiting. It's been an absolute pleasure, guys. Um, and uh, I look forward to reading that histogram ebook. Uh, you should keep me up at night. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. All right. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Todd, so much for coming. It was wonderful. We'll get Thanks, you back Todd. and yeah. see more of your yeah, work. Well, and hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks or so, Trey. Yes, sir. I can't yeah. wait. I'm uh, I'm really, really excited to be there. So thank you. Excellent. Uh, okay, I'll leave you now. Bye. Okay. Bye, Todd. Bye. 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 Okay, resume your thoughts, uh, Dallas and Ed. I had thoughts? No. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, well, I mean, I that was a lot. I mean, otherwise, I just had more examples of fashion photos. I don't know if you guys... Yeah, show us a couple more. And while you show us, I wanted to ask you, like, what advice would you give to people that want to get into fashion photography? Okay. It's very, very competitive. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it like, there's a... Uh, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of fashion photographers out there uh, a lot of them are very good so it's very difficult to get noticed uh, as far as far as fashion photography goes um I would say that one of the biggest ones um, is study the work of others um, like study what's in magazines and what's in lookbooks and I mean there you know of course with the internet it's a huge fashion community um, where there's there's entire blogs that are just dedicated to blogging about the photo shoots that people do. Yeah. Um, so this is one that I did recently, um, which was inspired by one of my current inspirations, uh, Guy Rock, who uh, is a New York based fashion photographer. And he's um, famous for shooting uh, the free people uh, lookbooks, a lot of those, um, where he does very loose photography. It's like almost like street photography a lot of the time where, you know, you just captured this random pretty girl walking around, but you know, they are actually planned shoots and he has his stylists and everything. 
Um, but he just makes it really like loose and free looking, which is what I aspire to do. Um, so this one was actually an accidental shot where I figured out if I parked on top of a parking structure and looked down, I had a really clear view of a street corner. And I don't usually come across these conveniently accessible places where I can be up high and shooting down where there's like good light and everything. So um, for this shot, you know, I'm up on top of parking structure and I'm on the phone with Ed, who's down there with the model, uh, <laughs> like kind of like directing her and telling her if she needs to move away from like where I, I can see her like the, behind the roof and stuff. And if any, if any of you guys are curious where there is a easily accessible parking lot that you can look down on a street corner and shoot uh, with great light. It's at North Nimitz and Mount Acaea. <laughs> yes. But, uh, this is one of those times where having, uh, you know, your significant other there with you helping out is is hugely useful. You know, I mean, I've, I've been standing there shooting while Jay holds an umbrella over my head, you know, and then we trade and I hold the umbrella because it's raining so hard that we will destroy each other, you know, our cameras, but it's useful to have a second. Yep. <laughs> yes, definitely. Absolutely. Especially because um, this is in Chinatown and you know that it can be a little sketchy there sometimes. So having, having a big guy around who can just intimidate yeah. anybody trying to take my camera, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. I intimidate all the, all the people <laughs> who might, you know, want to bother Jay. So he feels a lot safer having me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then from the same shoot, um, just kind of showing you for, for this shoot and one other one I did recently, um, it was start getting ready at four and maybe be shooting by 530 and then we'll shoot till sundown and see what we can get. And I try to just shoot fast, natural, I, you know, we're all digital. I'm not wasting film. So I'll probably like go like hundred to 200 frames per look and then be like, okay, I'm sure I got something, move on. Um, so then as you can see, uh, this next shot, sun's already gone down a lot. And this is about a block from the last shot. Actually, I think on this one, the sun is on the horizon. So we're like, we're literally about to lose the light. Um, yeah, so just we're and it was like, okay, this looks cool. Let's go ahead, try to shoot over here, walk across the street. And that's where we're shooting. Um, and again, like having a stylist helps, you know, like planning out the cool outfits, except I had to style this one, which is a little intimidating because I know so many good stylists. And so I'm hope they're not laughing at me too much. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and then, um, and then right after this shot, uh, the sun goes down and um, we have this light to work with. So it's a combination of dusk light and the street lights um, all around. So you can start to see like, there's a little bit of shadowing like under her neck and stuff from a street light that's just turning on. Yep. Um, and, and at this point, like, there's nothing for me to reflect. There's nothing for me to do unless I want to break out the strobes, which would completely alter the light. Yeah. So and this, all of this was taken in about a two block radius, I think, these last three shots. Do you guys tend to shoot toward the end of the day just so you can get the changing light? Um, well, we, like, oftentimes we have to shoot around other people's schedules. Mm -hmm. So, so we're, we're known for kind of like, again, our collaboration with nature, we just, we just make it work. You know, if somebody hands us something and says, we're looking for this, then we just do it, I guess you could say. Um, we do enjoy, uh, we do enjoy though, like shooting at the end of the day to get all of these different lighting situations. Um, you know, we've like, we've been known, especially because we got those, those Canon 1.1.4s 1. 1. and 1.2s. Um, you know, we've been known for shooting into the night and, you know, like say having people stand really still and getting long exposures of star strewn skies with, with people in it. So, uh, which but if you do it, it does. I guess yeah. I'll put you on the spot and say, if, you know, I offered you a three hour window anytime during the day, which, which three hours would you choose? Um, what are, what are you having me shoot? <laughs> for this kind of, you know, for some kind of a fashion, uh, shoot. Oh, I mean, I, I also keep in mind, like, what kind of shoot it's going to be. Um, <laughs> my friends are messaging me that they're so excited for Diablo 3 to come out in a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. Four and a half hours. <laughs> four hours, four hours. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, it depends, because, like, for this shoot that I, I kept in mind the clothing, 
um, you know, that very loose, free, urban, whatever. So I really like the idea of shooting into the the low light. Um, and it, you know, it, it's easy to make that beautiful the, afternoon light look the, good. The gentle, the gentle look, like um, the gentle light. But at the same time, if I wanted to shoot something that was really vivid, or graphic, um, like even shooting it like high noon can work because um, then you get like the bluest skies and the bluest ocean. Um, so it, it really depends. I guess probably this stuff is my favorite stuff yeah, to do. I think, so I think I think the just for variety's sake, we probably like considering considering that like we also keep track of when the sun's going to set. So right now it's setting at about seven. So we'd probably three hour window to shoot probably like five thirty to seven thirty. Yep. Right. So yeah, that's kind of what I've been working on. And again, it's just like yeah, not not trying to not have too much control. Yes. Dallas, you you flipped over one of your images. Could you go back to that one? It looked like it was a nighttime shot, and maybe you got the Milky Way volcano. Oh, volcano! <laughs> That's Halemamo. So, fun story about this one. Uh, like we went to like Hawaii just has this this. It's a very high density of really incredible things in one place. Like I can't even I can't even tell you. Come visit. Um, yes, come visit. <laughs> um, but this is at Volcano National Park. Now, about two years ago, two or three years ago, this volcano reactivated. So what you're seeing isn't actually magma or anything. It's, uh, steam, it's and steam and vapor coming from a magma lake. And, you know, just to give you an idea, like there isn't a very good uh, size reference here, but that that is a crater that... Oh, I don't know, like could probably fit a few city blocks in there. Like it's like a legitimate sci-fi coliseum type <laughs> scenario. And uh, when you drive up to it, it's glowing just like that. Like this is, this is very similar. I don't know, like do you want to pull up the raw, honey? I don't know where it is. <laughs> no. Well, uh, the raw, like even in the raw, you're able to see like the skies and uh, and uh, the Milky Way. And it's not a... Uh, like it is, um, it's not like the colors aren't as saturated, but it looks just like that. And it's really yeah, incredible. That's, that's my go. favorite of all the shots you had. <laughs> I love that shot. Let's see, is this, wait, bring up my windows. Um, okay, yeah, this is the DNG file, so I can go into here. And show you guys the original. But so, and this kind of like brings you to our point, you know, kind of like with, uh, with H, you know, speaking of uh, what Todd was talking about earlier with his kind of like HDR effect of raw, um, you know, raw shooting in raw is a very essential part to our process. The reason is because um, we, you know, we have our highlight alert, alert on at all times and we look to minimize the areas that we've blown out. And that way um, we, we retain as much data as possible. And this kind of like goes back to how Ansel Adams popularized darkroom photography. Um, what, we, what we strive to do is that we use all that extra data, which, you know, like, like uh, I believe JPEG has 100 and, no, 256 colors per pixel. Uh, per pixel. RAWs have about, you know, 2,000 or something like that. So you're, there's just so much more information that you're able to work with there. And, and this is actually um, the before and after of the DNG file that I imported into Lightroom. And so before is completely raw and after is all within Lightroom edits. Nice. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and I actually, I actually have this one uh, going into a gallery show um, on the Big Island at the National Park uh, at the end of the month, which is exciting because I think it's my first post-college gallery See? showing. And you were just going to skip over it? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's because um, Dallas thinks I was in, it, in the last two weeks, uh, it's, I've just been all about fashion, 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 fashion. But yeah, a month ago, it was all landscapes and starscapes and this stuff. So yeah. like I said, I kind of do everything. Yeah, I mean, it's so crazy that that before and after and uh, I love I love seeing that stuff. It's just um, I feel like photography is changing so much and it? it's also computational. You just you go out and you just have like a good feeling about the light at the place. And you think, ah, oh, you know, this is like, it's a wonderful sketch. It's like a, a starting point. It's just an alpha. Yeah. You think, oh my gosh, there's so many possible omegas to this shot. 
Yeah. And then, you know, I think for those of us that love post-processing, that love being in front of a computer, love playing with Lightroom and all these other plugins, we just, we get really excited about bringing this little sketch or this rough idea back into our computers to really play with. I think it's, uh, this is so exciting to me. It's, it's even more fun to um, go back and take the work that you've um, extensively processed like a year ago and reprocessing it and seeing how your style has changed. I'm going to show an example of something just like that because I just did that um, a couple days ago. Nice. Also, I want to, just a quick note, since we have the, the histogram book coming out, <laughs> um, <laughs> like, 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 histi like histogram is, is incredibly important to doing work like this. And I'll tell you right now that, um, like, at least, at least for me personally, working with a RAW that I know is properly exposed and has as much data available as possible like I could literally like looking at the looking at the histogram cover the photo and and edit just using the histogram and then get 90% of the way to a finished photo so it is it is an enormously important thing that that you that you as a digital photographer should learn it, you know the, the general you but I completely great, agree <laughs> cool all right let's go to uh ron do you want to go next and talk about sure. uh one of you one of one or more of your projects you have going on and then we'll uh, do scott after that yeah absolutely absolutely and also maybe dave if you want to get a few pictures ready and even brian uh, the chat room the Twit chat room wants to see some of your photos. <laughs> so this is a good chance. You have to get some ready to share with us. Cool. Okay, so go ahead, Ron. Yeah. Well, you know, my, like I said, my, uh, most of my photography, I'm not, you know, I can't call myself a professional photographer. I don't really sell. I've only sold one image or one set of images in my life. And it was the playboy magazine. <laughs> but, but if I actually Whoa. tell you the rest of that story, it's much less interesting than you would think. It was pictures at the, uh, it, they were just contacted me randomly on some pictures they saw on my blog of the Tsukiji fish market uh, in Japan in the morning. So basically all my photos to play bit were of dead fish. So yeah, don't, don't, don't tell that part of it. Just stick with the beginning of that. And yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Well, I thought that's why people of... buy the magazine anyway. I was under the impression that it was mm. about the articles. It's about yeah, the articles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so most of my stuff, but I mean, most of the photography I do kind of for pleasure is, uh, is when I travel, you know, and, and as much as anything, it's sort of an excuse to travel and kind of remember uh, what I saw and everything. And, you know, the interesting thing about doing photography when you travel, as I'm sure everybody has seen, especially those that don't travel with a, a spouse who is as into photography as they are, is that you sort of have limited time sometimes for setting mm -hmm. up tripods and all of that. Has but I think a lot of it about. is... Yeah, a lot of it is kind of deciding what the uh, you know what what kind of interesting shots you can get at places that have been well photographed before, and and things like that. So even something like this, which is Petra in Jordan, everybody probably remembers this from the Indiana, Indiana Jones movie, uh, where they're going into this. <laughs> you know, trying to find an interesting angle on it, uh, and in this case, this cat that was just sort of hanging out there. I mean, the the standard shot that everybody gets when you go to Petra is this one and you have to take it and it is indeed pretty spectacular coming down this huge long hallway and then suddenly there's this massive building and camels in front of you when you show up but I wanted to try and find something a little different as well but so yeah most of my most of my photography is is as I travel and you know here's <laughs> something that's uh, extraordinarily cute uh, <laughs> in, uh I think this was up in in uh in Banff, just outside of Banff, and there's this uh, this mother and a couple little baby cubs. And you know, the advice here, much like uh, knowing not to get too close to the lava, is, <laughs> is to don't get between the mother and her cubs. Uh, this was just a little black bear, so it wasn't quite as bad. But we were mostly shooting, you know, a few steps away from the car. So the, the trick is to make sure you can get into the car before she can get to you. I have, I a, I have a really quick question. Yeah. It, like, is there is there another shot where you have the the mother bear and then three cubs all standing up, uh, one after the other? No, not no. Uh, I think in this one, I mean, that was really part of the challenge. That and keeping away the mosquitoes was sort of trying to come up with, um, 
something where you know you, you you get an interesting shot of all of them at once. And I got a couple that didn't work, but it was always you know it's hard to get them all to pose together. Oh, I saw I, I saw I saw one with a cub that looked just like that, and I was like, I wonder. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I ever got one that had everything posed the way I wanted it, and so I ended up. This is actually even a crop in on it because we we didn't, weren't that close, and I didn't have a super long lens. Okay. In fact, I think I only, I only had. I think this was just an eighty-five, so we were fairly close, but there was a little bit of a ravine between between them and us. So, uh, but yeah, and even you know little critters like this. Um, <laughs> oh, <that's funny. laughs> this is just a little baby anteater in uh, in Venezuela. And which was an interesting place to travel to. Venezuela, the whole reason to, to go there is is to That's see cool. this. <laughs> um, nice. Which is certainly one of my favorite shots. This is Angel Falls, uh, the tallest waterfall in the world. And it's really an ordeal to get there. I mean, Venezuela is, is very challenging in and of itself. It's We hadn't kind of realized it until we booked the flights, but it's one of the most dangerous countries in the world in terms of like the highest murder rate and extremely oh. high crime. Uh, and also very difficult to travel around. And so it was hard traveling just because you're kind of always looking over your shoulder. And, you know, I remember when we checked into the hotel the first night, literally the guy that was checking us in started drawing diagrams of how people will attack you in the streets and which direction. You should <laughs> I mean, he, he had this piece of paper and he, he was, you know, literally drawing these diagrams on the paper. Of, it was like a football diagram of, of, the, of the play going, little X's and O's and everything. He's like, well, they'll come down this way, and then they'll come this way in the back. So you need to turn this direction and go. <laughs> but he has little pamphlets ready to hand out. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, hey, um, hey, Ron, that's one of the better shots of Angel Falls I've ever seen. Uh, what advice do you have for for taking that, taking photos of that waterfall? Because I've seen a lot of really boring photos of that waterfall. Yeah, well, Angel you know, it's, I took I took a lot of really boring <laughs> photos of this of this as well. It's to get to this to get to Angel Falls, you have to. Uh, you basically take these canoes upriver uh, for for a good distance, and then you hike even further to get sort of, and you can get to the base of the falls and hike up in that. Uh, but you know, like in everything, it's it's all about the light, right? And so I I took a lot of. Well, I don't know if I can get something up fast enough. I'll see if I can pop up some of the other shots I got. But they were all very flat, and especially some of the stuff I shot the day before. But you, the nice thing is, if if you make this journey up there, then you can. There's places where you can sort of spend the night. They have hammocks kind of set up. And you spend the night uh, out in a hammock. And so the real trick was the next morning, I pretty much woke up at break of dawn. Everybody else was still snoring in their hammocks and did a little mini hike up and uh, and found found this shot. And it was really transient. I have, well, let me see if I can get this up reasonably quickly. Um, I, have, I have the shot that is about literally like 30 seconds later and is completely fogged in. Uh, so it really kind of shows how you know, how transient some of these lighting conditions are, uh, and it, it's very it, it's touchy. And you just you know it's like anything with landscape photography. I'm I'm sure you know you've all dealt with this, where it's just a matter of of patience and trying to just waiting for that right shot to come along. But yeah, I have tons of shots that are just so boring. This one is actually a stitch uh, of of several things put together too. So it's uh, it's kind of layered together. Not so much to change any of the lighting or everything, but just to get me a, a higher resolution. So I shot one that was just wide, and then I just went ahead and panned around with a little bit more of a zoom and caught a bunch of stuff to stitch together. But I guess, you know, so for me, the the travel photography is certainly a lot of it. You know, even in uh, in Egypt, a shot like um, this. I'm jealous now. Which is... <laughs> well, we are yeah. totally jealous. <laughs> but again, this, you know, here, here's the before on this shot. So, you know, I, and at some point you can just sort of say, all right, am I going to, I generally tend to do not a whole lot of processing, mostly because I guess my background, like I said, is doing visual effects. And so I've worked on a lot of movies where we had to do all kinds of crazy post-processing and stuff. I mean, literally, you know, the director decides that the actress looks too fat and you have to go back in and, and fix that and, you know, squeeze in, squeeze in the shape of, of her ass or something. <laughs> and, and I've done that. I mean, I've absolutely done that work. So I'm very comfortable doing a whole lot of post-processing on images. So I'd say I tend to not do a whole lot. But when you've got something like this, you know, you, you, you kind of don't have a lot of choice but to try and punch it up using something. 
And in a lot of ways, it, it gives a feel for it that you don't necessarily get by seeing something that's completely flat. And I also do tend to shoot very flat as well because you kind of want to get as much, you know, in the middle of the histogram as possible uh, and then have that, that ability to kind of tweak it up and down. But I think most of my, other than traveling, you know, a lot of my photography tends to kind of go uh, into the realm of just what intrigues me and I'll get strange ideas for things I want to try. So, you know, I'll show you something here that I was playing with uh, a few months back. which is I set up a little mirror box, uh, an internal reflecting box where you just go by, go to the hardware store and buy uh, some mirrored tiles you know, about a foot across. Ends up looking something like this. And then I literally just put the camera inside the box and put the top on it and started shooting photos. So in a lot of them you can see the camera in the shot. <laughs> but I kind of you know, like the look of even that and you know, toss in some aluminum foil and everything. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, that's really that's cool. Neat. Yeah, you know, it 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 was one of those things where I wasn't quite sure what I was going to get, but you know, so I just built a little box. Here's the lid. Now, Ron, were you on drugs when you did this? <laughs> <laughs> it helps, but in this case, I wasn't. <laughs> so, but yeah, but I guess you know, so so I do a lot of photography. That's just kind of what intrigues me, and then and then coming from that background <laughs> of doing visual effects and image processing, I guess. Because I have that, a lot of time I, I do look for ways of, of getting alternate alternate kind of shots out of stuff. Uh, and that's kind of what inspired me to do this little iPhone app that, that I've put together. Uh, the app is called Freeze Paint, and it's, it's just been released. But I wanted to show you kind of just a couple shots from it. Um, screen share these. So I'll give you like a real basic example, first of all. Screen share. And Ron, is this this is available now in the App Store, right? It is available now. Yeah, you can just search for Freeze Paint, um, or just go to freezepaintapp.com, all one word. And what it is, I was really trying to put together something that allowed you to do compositing, if you will, multiple layering kind of things, without having to deal with layers at all. So the basic model is you just kind of point your camera at something and then finger paint on the screen and it'll freeze whatever is under your finger, whatever you've just painted on. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it really quick and easy to just do these really fast photo collages of things. So, you know, here's some people playing volleyball on the beach. But even just, you know, taking, moving the camera a little bit and running your finger across the screen to freeze certain parts of the scene into it. And obviously you can do all of these things using Photoshop, you know, and it would be, you could you could do a much better job, I would I suppose you could say. But the point of this was to avoid ever having to go into post processing, to just be able to do it all with your iPhone, playing with the uh, sort of the collaging and the mixing right right while you're on it. And you can get some pretty impressive stuff just using that. Here's uh, something that somebody did with their dog, <laughs> and I love this because it was just a little spontaneous thing that he said he did when he saw his dog sleeping next to a tennis ball. Uh, and again, no post processing other than just pointing your camera and kind of moving it around and touching where the the tennis ball was at. Um, again, the six arm things. I see a lot of people even just doing scrapbooking kind of stuff with that. Here's the dinner that you put together or the the lunch you had. Dare, dare I ask? Is this on Android? It it, it is not on Android yet. Um, it's one of those tough decisions about. How how quick do you do your port, and in which one do you do first? But now yeah. I'm afraid it's it's iPhone only at this point. But if enough people purchase it, and then it makes <laughs> sense, right? So you still have incentive to tell people to buy it, even if you're an Android person. That's my yeah. thinking on it. But even something like this, where you just kind of get somebody to jump, and you just again, this wasn't a Photoshop thing. It was just sort of painted on the screen with your finger. And the nice thing is, you shoot in front of a background that's sort of neutral and forgiving, like the sky, and you know some of where the mat lines would be they just kind of naturally tend to blend together uh, but you know, I've seen some some pretty you know the other wacky thing that you can do is do quick kind of a remix on on people's faces so my my niece uh, my niece just did this one to me the other day with <laughs> oh, wow that is nice 
pick one. <laughs> so, I mean, that's me with, with yeah, with another niece's uh, eyes put on it. She did this one with my, my brother-in-law oh, and my little good. niece. That's going to sell it right there. It's, it's, it's really heinous, the things you can do. But, yeah. And I've seen plenty of people already putting, you know, dog heads on something. But, yeah, some of these are just eerily interesting. <laughs> and I was, I was really happy to see that because my nieces are, are about like 9 and 11, and they really jumped onto it. They really enjoyed the, the kind of creative nature of it. You know, they would never be able to dive into Photoshop and do something like that, but just being able to do this sort of on the fly, it was, it was pretty gratifying to see it. So uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it's the kind of thing where a lot of people just come up with weird stuff using it and, and send it in because that's, for me, that's what gets me jazzed is you make a tool and, and you kind of see what people that are more creative than you are end up doing with it. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff coming my way, stuff that I'd, I hadn't expected at all. That's really kind of what I'm hoping for. But, yeah, like I said, it's, you know, freezepaintapp.com. It's, it's 99 cents because we have to make some money on these things. But, but I'll give you your money back if you don't I'll like it. I'll buy it. She wants an Android I have version. to go charge my <laughs> iPod so I can get it. I guess. It does, the, as long as your iPod Touch has, has a camera on it, yeah. then... Uh, <laughs> It totally works, so feel free. But, but you got one sale there, Ron. You Excellent. are a great salesman. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. So it's fun. And like I said, you know, everybody just play with it and share it with the world. Cool. Well, thank you, Ron, for that. Best of luck with that app. Um, hey, Scott, do you want to go next? Yeah. And you want to see some pictures first? Whatever. Whatever you want. Yeah. We'll Let's show do. some pictures here. Impress us. Always. We're we're ready. Um, you gotta follow a lot of good art. That that so, photo is not good, Scott Cublin. Wait a minute. I have a nice little <laughs> intro here. Wait, wait, I'm about to blow your mind. You see the screen, right? It takes Yes, yeah. we see a, okay. a very boring yeah. bad photo. Exactly. <laughs> this is gonna inspire everyone else out there to get mm -hmm. into photography. So I'm showing you a bunch of my befores and then the final shot. So you can see. Ah, I see what you're doing now, Cublin. Mm -hmm. Mojo buster. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is obviously um, Disney World. And you can see it's crooked in this shot. So this was the probably minus two. And I'll give this one just a second. And then this is the zero. And this is my plus two, which if you look at it, it's kind of blurry. So if something moved, so most likely I did not even use the third one when I actually I probably didn't use it for tone mapping or masking it in. Hey, so Scott, I don't think you're sharing your screen right. You might want to share your whole desktop because we still see the minus two. We see the slideshow thing. Ah, is there better? it is. Now we see the plus two, I guess. Yeah, but you're seeing all the other stuff on the screen too. Okay, but. Plus two. Okay, so there's a plus two. It's a little bit blurry. So there's the zero again. Okay. okay. Plus two. And then that's the tone map one. So it's okay there, but pay attention to the castle is actually a little bit crooked. And the sky, you can see in the sky it's got some colors. Like there's some warm colors towards the top, and there's some warmer colors down towards the bottom. So the final shot is what I'm going to go to next. And you'll see where I fixed the the leaning of the castle a little bit, I really brought out the colors of the sky and the water and everything else. Is that showing now for everybody? Yeah. Okay, so I'll just jump before, which the tone mapped, and then if you just look at the shift, you can see where I straightened everything. And I used the warp tool inside of Photoshop to correct the, uh, the castle, which made it a little bit fatter, but you know what? Nobody knows that the castle is not that fat <laughs> unless you look at the before and after. Okay, next shot. So, Scott, by the way, I'm a little, uh, I'm not impressed by your tripod skills. <laughs> well, I don't know why. You know what? I don't think I you're used wrong, a tripod right wrong. here. I didn't bring a tripod with me. I was in Disney. I don't have special VIP oh. access like you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so was, this, was this handheld? There's like, a little seat area there where you could sit down, and there's a little column that prevents you from falling into this little, what is it, a moat? And... Mm -hmm. So I just had to handhold it. So there, that's why okay. it was shaky. I just All right. That. Okay, so that's why. Mm -hmm. But still, just using the two bracketed shots, the minus two and the zero, I came up with that. 
Good result. Very good. Yep. So this one is with a tripod. This is obviously Radio City Music Hall. And this is the minus two. Zero. And the plus two. And when you're in New York and you're trying to wait for a cab to go by, it does not take long at all. So I wasn't there very long. And so there's the tone mapped one. And there's my final one. So if you want to know some of the things that I did between the tone mapped and the final shot, if you look at the where it says Radio City on the right-hand side, I'm going to jump to the right before where the tone map one is. You can see I changed the angle up a little bit. The Radio City is leaning a little bit to the left because I was using a wide angle, and it just didn't feel right. So I just kind of straightened a little bit, not too much, but it just didn't feel right. Something about it didn't feel right like that. And I also darkened some of the building. I wanted you to know the building was there, but I didn't really want it to be in your face. Mm -hmm. And I enhanced where it says Ron White in here because I figured, you know, if Ron White saw this, he'd say, shoot, I got to have that shot. It's got my name on the thing. <laughs> Enhance. Next. Okay, the flat iron, which this thing drove me crazy because if you notice, the right side of the flat iron does not come down as far as the left side. It's, and you know, I've looked at a lot of other people's shots of this, and it's it's not just how I took the shot. For some reason, it's not symmetrical. And so there's my, I don't know, minus two, zero. Again, the cabs, there are plenty there. The plus two, there's the tone mapped one. And again, pay attention to this right side. It just didn't feel right to me, the fact that it wasn't balanced. So I just manipulated it a little bit and tried to balance it some. And that's the final shot there. Okay. All right. I just did this one two days ago, two or three days ago. And this is where I was talking about where I, I went back, a, you know, a couple of years ago and took a shot and just processed it. And I never processed this a couple of years ago because it was just a single raw. I didn't bracket it. It was on a moving boat. And I just didn't think it was that great of a shot. Plus the fact that I was off the boat later on and in front of the Eiffel Tower with a tripod and got what I thought was a much better shot. But So going back two years, actually one year, and just using a single RAW, I used Lightroom and I used Photoshop. And that, you, you'll see I'm kind of cycling through several different variations of the single RAW because inside of Lightroom I would create virtual copies of it and then adjust the development settings for those duplicate or virtual copies and then mask those in inside of Photoshop. So here's another one here where I'm just enhancing another part of the composition. And then I even tone mapped a single raw. And then there's my final. Cool. And if you look closely, you'll see I'll go back one. You'll see that the, the tower was leaning a little bit to the left. And that just bothered me. And so I'll go to the next shot, which is the final one. You'll see that I straightened it a little bit. Might have made it a little bit fatter on the bottom, but no one's called me yet to say that it's not proportionally correct. So <laughs> I keep thinking this is CSI photography. <laughs> Enhance. <laughs> Enhance. Yeah, that's a good. I like that shot. It's yeah, kind of and I mean, this was on the boat, which I mean, it's not like it was a speedboat zipping by, but for a single shot, I think it turned out nice. Yeah. Uh, now, did with those talk about those colors, the oranges in the bottom? Did you add those, or were they in there somewhere in the raw? Yeah, well, I used Vivesa from Nick Software and just put the little control point in there and just enhanced different areas. But if I'll go back now to, well, here's the tone mapped one, and uh, I'd zoom in, but I'm in the slideshow mode right now. But those colors are there. They're not as drastic, dramatic as I made them, but they really are there. I don't go in and paint something in there. I just use different plugins to enhance the colors or warm things up or increase the saturation a little bit. But I did not go in and just create some fake colors that were not there. You know, you had to have cat eyes to see it like this, but that's, <laughs> that's how it was. Okay, so here's one where I went back two years ago and just processed this one a couple of days ago. So this is London. And this is the minus two. There's the zero. And just like taxi cabs in New York, these tour of London buses, very, very easy to get into shots because they're everywhere. And there's the plus two, 
which gives you the little streakiness of the cars. That's the tone mapped shot, which is a little sloppy. You can see the streaks kind of sloppy. And then my final shot is there. And some of the things I did with this one is I just corrected the lean of the buildings a little bit. If I go back, it's kind of hard to see. I did crop it a little bit, but also the buildings, I think it was this one here, it just was leaning a little bit too much to the left, I believe. And I just, I fixed that. I also enhanced the streaks. And if you look at the sidewalk over here, you can see it's got this checkered pattern on it. And if I go back one, you can see that it's much bigger squares. But I had to um, clone in some areas there because I, actually, I think I got rid of some of these. See the arrows here? There's two arrows. There really was two arrows, a faded arrow and this newly painted arrow. But I just felt that was a little bit distracting. And so I got rid of those in post as well. And then the, I kind of cloned in a lot of this over here on the left. And so that's it. All right. Thanks, Scott. Do you want to, uh, would you like to give people, uh, actually, I'll come back to you after we do Verena because I want you to give a sneak preview of an awesome new website that <laughs> I know you are secretly building. Okay. Ooh. I'll try and figure out what that is and then get back with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll go ahead and give a, 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 even more of a hint. This is the secret HDR spotting 2.0 that is private and in development now. And wait till you see what uh, Scott is cooking up for us. Very, very awesome. Okay, Verena, are you ready to share, share, share with us? I am ready. Let me share my screen here. And let's see if you can see what I want to show you. All right, is that showing up? Yes. Excellent. All right, so, um, you know, I, I've spent the past uh, 22 years maybe, um, you know, learning the basics of photography, which, which sounds silly. You know, you don't think it's going to take you 22 years to learn the basics, but I, I think that, um, it does take that long. It can, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a matter of learning so much. There's the technical side of things and the, um, you know, learning how your camera responds in certain situations in certain lighting conditions, what kind of light your camera can handle, what it can't handle. Right. Um, and then at the same time, I've been teaching, um, for, uh, five or six years now. And what I started to realize while I was teaching uh, was that I was learning as much as I was teaching because as I tried to explain to somebody what was going on in my head in order to teach them or to answer the question they'd asked me, I was finding that I actually had to formulate thoughts in a way I really hadn't uh, experienced before. You know, I'd, I'd spent so much time creating images, but I wasn't really thinking about what I was doing. And suddenly I was forced to think about it and to put it into words. And then that carried over into my blogs and, and um, you know, the eBooks and, and all that stuff. And so um, I think over the past two years now, I've gotten to the point where I feel like I really know what I want you to see. <laughs> and so, you know, I almost feel like I have to go back and sort of erase some of what I did before and say, no, 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 wait, don't, don't look at that. That's not what I meant. Now I have it figured out. This is what I mean. Um, and, and in two years, I'm going to come back and I'm going to say, okay, I, I had it all wrong, so sorry. Um, but for now, <laughs> what I've been working on more than anything is capturing this feeling that I get when I'm in the wilderness. So it's no longer for me about capturing what's there, capturing the, the colors, getting them just right and getting the light just right and, and um, you know, every single detail. What I'm trying to do now is, is give this sense of what's going on in my head. And when I'm in the wilderness, I am absolutely at peace. That's where I am quiet. I am sort of centered. I feel completely free out there. And so when I get out there, that's all of a sudden what I'm trying to capture. And now I have the technical skills so that I can say, okay, this filter, this setting, this aperture, whatever it is, and uh, I can... I can see in my head exactly what I want to create. Um, so that's what this collection is about. It's, it's much more minimalistic. I don't think that's actually a word. It's much more minimalist than it was before. 
Um, and there, there's a simplicity to it that I'm really working to develop. So um, this is a shot from, um, yeah, uh, let's go with Yokel Sarlon. I have no idea how to say that. <laughs> it's, in, it's in Iceland. Uh, it starts with a J. I know the J sounds like a Y, so that's all I got. Um, the rest of it is lots of letters. Um, but in this case, what I was trying to do is capture the mood. It was raining. Um, you know, the waves were coming at me. These incredible icebergs, the icebergs were scattered, scattered all along the uh, black sand beach. And what I wanted to show was not quite what I was seeing, but instead what I was feeling, which was this incredible sense that I was somewhere I had never been before. And there was so much peace in this place, you know? And so I got out my uh, graduated neutral density filter. It was already starting to get dark that evening. Um, and, uh, you know, I wanted a really long shutter speed. Uh, this was about 30 seconds. And um, I went from there. And then in, in post-processing, um, you know, I, I let the image go a little more blue than it was in reality, although it was pretty darn blue out there. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and then I let that, those waves, you know, rather than showing you any detail in the waves, I just wanted them to, to um, become this mist that covered the sand. So, um, and again, in order to simplify the image as much as possible and make it feel as quiet as possible. Um, so here's a shot from Vistai Wilderness in New Mexico. And again, I'm, you know, I was really working to give this sense of um, minimalistic quiet. And this place is huge. You can go for miles and miles and never see another person. Um, and we did. <laughs> you know, you're climbing around uh, over these bizarre formations, and it's it's just this sense that you're in an alien world. And so rather than shooting this in typical light, um, I actually waited until the sun went down and I sat here for a while and just kind of, you know, breathed it in, um, which for me is really what this is all about. Um, so once the sun set, um, you know, there was this very slight glow in the sky and that's what I wanted to capture, the glow in the sky, but also the reflected light, um, the reflected afterglow really. Um, on these strange little hoodoos. Um, and I also used a little bit of extra light from my headlamp um, to light them just for a fraction of a second. Again, this is very long exposure. I think this is about 20 seconds. And, uh, you know, so I used the, the light just to brighten it up a little bit so I didn't have to do it later in Photoshop. And um, the colors are, are pretty close to true because that's what I wanted to show, that, that sort of glow that you get after the light is gone. So, um, yeah, here's a shot, uh, also from Iceland. This one's Skogafoss, um, which is a beautiful waterfall out there. And the entire time we were in Iceland, I, I'm pretty sure we got about 60 minutes of sunlight. Um, the rest of the time it was pouring rain, absolutely, uh, you know, painful horizontal wind. It was gorgeous, but um, the weather was not dry <laughs> at all. So, um, and this shot from Skogafoss, um, you know, I, again, I used a, a GND filter in order, or sorry, a, a ND filter, a neutral density filter in order to get as, as much shutter speed as I could. In fact, I used two of them because as you can tell, the sun was out um, and that's just a rainbow in front of the white waters. Uh, what I noticed was that all these photographers were there and they had their wide angle lenses out and they were capturing the surrounding area. But to me, the the beauty was in the colors against the white background of the water. So that's what I wanted to capture. Here's a shot from St. Mary Lake in Montana. And in this case, um, the light was just ridiculous. It was incredible. Um, this is before the sunrise. And we were out there with a group of students, um, usually when I'm working with students, I won't do a lot of shooting, but I do have my camera there because a lot of times, you know, it's, it's easier to explain something by demonstrating. Um, and I like to show what I'm thinking through, through the lens sometimes. So I'll take a shot and show them 
what I mean when I say this is what will happen with our uh, neutral density filter. This is what a graduated neutral density filter will do for you, you know, um, or, or a circular, circular polarizer. And I find, again, that teaching that has really made it clear in my mind what those things will do. So I no longer have to take a test shot in order to see in my head what's going to come out the other end, you know, when it's done. So that's been a, a huge, um, a huge boon to my photography. Um, but in this case, it was raining again. Um, but an opening in the clouds behind me let some light in over the horizon before the sun was up. And uh, so this alpine glow appeared on the mountain in front of me. And it was just, I mean, it was just jaw dropping. So once again, long exposure. Um, you can tell I really like those. And I had a, a ND filter and a GMD filter both on the camera. And I'm going to say I had a circular polarizer on there, too, based on the fact that you can see through the water to the rocks below. But um, it's possible that I didn't. Uh, but the main thing is I, this was a 30-second exposure, and I only had to clean off one water droplet despite the rain and the splashing waves. <laughs> so, um, But this one I like to show, or I wanted to show tonight, because um, this isn't what the scene looked like at all. Uh, the mountain looked like that. But the sky, you know, clouds, they don't look like they're moving when they're moving, right? Um, so what I was trying to show uh, in the finished image was this sense that, you know, time is just passing like crazy. So you've got the sky there. And then the foreground, I wanted to get rid of all the details and the waves um, to simplify it, to let you see the, the sort of subtle rocks underneath the water and the, and the patterns underneath without um, adding too much detail to the image. I uh, just have a few more here. This one is a frozen droplet right here in Ohio. Um, Jay and I live in Ohio near Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And um, this is one of the smaller parks nearby. And again, actually on this day I was out with my kids. And we were, um, they all had their cameras and we were just out having fun in this freezing cold weather. But uh, it was late in fall and we'd had a really hard freeze overnight. Um, so these little water droplets were hanging from everything. Um, so I had my daughter move a branch so that the yellow in the background or the orange in the background um, was directly behind my droplet, and she she did a great job. So uh, I got my background that I wanted and uh, really narrowed up the field to bring out the detail in the water droplet but let everything else disappear into the background. This is, again, a long exposure from um, Pine Glades Lake in Florida. and um, what I wanted to show was the glow on the water, but I couldn't get it uh, with a, a standard shutter speed because there was um, there were a lot of ripples on the surface of the lake. So you end up with this image that just isn't really that appealing. Um, as soon as I put that um, ND filter on there, the surface was smooth and the color just you know came out of every single area of the lake. So it was just crazy to watch it do that. Um, and again, I was there with students, and it was really nice to be able to show them what I meant, because a lot of times students don't want to take out their uh, equipment. They're not used to it. It's, it's, you know, it feels like something that's, um, I don't know, it's too much work, you know. And I always tell them, look, you got up at like 3 o'clock in the morning or, or, you know, hiked five miles or whatever. It's not too much work to take out a filter. Do it. Do it. You know, <laughs> so... Um, so this was one of those where I, I was able to use this image to teach. Um, and then here's here's my last shot. This is Mule Canyon in Utah. This is House on Fire, uh, which are some ruins. Um, and I don't know very much about them except that they're really, really pretty. Um, but, you know, we went hiking out there, and this is reflected light. It's actually a midday shot. The, the light is reflecting off. Um, the canyon walls or the, the floor of the canyon really and bouncing up to light the, the top of this this um, incredible structure that makes it look like it's on fire and uh, while I was looking at these images on the plane before I had done any processing um, Jay and I both had our, our screens open and the flight attendant leaned over and said oh my god that's a terrible fire and you know so Jay and I kind of looked at each other and we were like did she really think that was a fire? Um, and it, she really did. She thought it was just an incredible fire. 
So, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's a, it's an amazing place, really incredible. But uh, that that's what I'm trying to do. This is sort of representative, I think, of, of what I'm trying to create right now and, and uh, how my photography has shifted over the past couple of years towards this minimalist style and, and um, you know, not so much about worrying about the details, but um, using this knowledge I've, I've gained from experience and from teaching to come away with something that, that really shows what's in my head. Well, thanks, Rena. You know, any one of those images would look great as a cover on your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, point yeah, taken. Just use this cover and then just, <laughs> just use white Helvetica and say histogram. <laughs> and I can, I can help you sell 10 times as many. As well. you wish. <laughs> your wish is my command. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Okay. Um, all right. Before we go to our Google Plus discoveries, I've got a great one for you guys. But let's hear uh, Scott. Give us. Uh, you know, don't don't take too long. We don't want to give give people too much. But just give us forty five seconds of uh, what's coming up on on the new HDR spotting. Do you want me to share it or you, the screen? Or you just want me to talk it. about it? Yeah, you can show a little secret secret. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Screen share. So here's the story behind it, in case he doesn't tell you. We, we've had HDR spotting up for a couple of years, and uh, we decided to completely redo it, redo the engine, redo the technology. Um, there's all kinds of stuff happening now, uh, and it's, it's taken a lot longer than expected, it's taken a lot more development, um, and uh, been more expensive and all that sort of thing. But, man, it is, it is really coming together. But anyway, So anyway, go ahead and show us, Scott. Okay, so you see the screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me just start off saying you can't, if you don't already have an account with HDR spotting from the previous version, you can't register right now because we're still fine tuning everything and we're making sure everything's scalable and it works and there's algorithms working in the background. So um, just know that in the next week or two, we will be opening up the registration so that you can register if you would like to be out there. And we're going to have uh, totally free accounts as well as pro accounts. We're still working on the pricing for the pro accounts, but they're very, very affordable and give you some more options. So you can see we've got uh, the page is kind of broken into three different columns. We have a latest column, newly popular, which takes up two columns, and then editor's picks. And as I scroll down, you'll see that the newly popular header stays here so you're always looking at the newly popular here you're always looking at the latest on the left and the editors picked here and different from the previous version of the site if you click on a particular image you go to a detailed page and the other site used to just jump directly to the person's website or their Flickr account so we have the little light box view here where if you click on it you get the large version of it and you can see all the other photos from this contributor. Now you're seeing some extra features here that I see as add and you won't be able to see all those, but you'll be able to like a photo. Uh, and anyone can report a photo, uh, which reminds me that when you do submit a photo, it goes out there right away now. There's no manual approval as there was with the old account. Uh, it pulls the EXIF information off of the shots. Or if for some reason you don't have the EXIF information, when you upload your shots, you can add it in yourself. No location available over here. It will be showing you the map where the shot was taken. Again, it will read the EXIF information. If, if it didn't, or if you took the shot with something that doesn't geotag it, you can manually um, plot in where you took the shot from. Different columns here is if you just want to see the latest ones, you click there and it'll start populating with the latest images. Same with popular editor's picks, and then the advanced sort is just a way for you to narrow down your selection. So if you wanted to see all shots that we're taking with, I don't know, 14 to 24, 2.8, you can sort by that, and it'll show you all those shots. And you can sort by different categories, by different cameras. You can type in different tags, so you can kind of narrow down exactly what you want to see. And I'll end this in just a couple of seconds here, but the other neat thing that we have going on here is a, uh, a virtual currency or a token system where you can actually generate tokens for doing different things throughout the site, which you will then be able to use to cash in for a variety of things. And some of the things that we're thinking of are some uh, 
webinars, maybe some hangout positions, some software that some vendors can uh, put out there for you to purchase, some plugins for Photoshop, tons and tons of different things that you can use to cash in this, this virtual currency. So I will leave it at that so that I can continue building some hype about all the other things that are coming with it. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Scott. I know it's been a lot of hard work. I'm, I'm totally excited about it. So thank you. Yep, sure. Thank you. All right, let's jump into uh, some, some discoveries. Um, I'll go ahead and share mine right away. Um, this is a super bonus discovery because embedded within it are hundreds of other sub-discoveries. Let me uh, take that highly enshrouded in mystery uh, segue and share my screen. <laughs> Right here. Okay, so okay, this girl. Uh, I don't. I don't think she's a photographer. I don't actually know anything about her. Her name is Isabel Sousa Silva. Okay, and what all she seems to do. This picture is not representative of it, but all she does is find other cool photographers and kind of assemble all their photos into a bunch of different albums. And she's super active. She's always finding really neat stuff, very interesting stuff. And for example, I'll just show you two that I found here. Uh, this is this is one of her. Um, uh, this is one of her things. Uh, like down at the bottom, she she gives each she gives credit to the photographers. I don't know if I'm so thrilled with the idea of her copying images into her into her little her own albums. It doesn't really bother me because she does give credit. You know, like this is by Nona Lapsi. And these are just a few images um, from this person. I mean, really cool stuff. Kind of stuff I don't think I would find on my own. Um, very interesting work, though. That's like one set of examples. Here's another uh, album that she made from a photographer named uh, um, Iwona Drozda Suburgin or something. Um, just again, very interesting work, um, all over the place, everything from landscape to details to models, um, Miss Isabel finds it all. So I do recommend uh, following this girl because then you can find a lot of other photographers through her. Cool. All right, good. Let me unscreen share. And, oh, real quick, I want to fulfill a request from the chat room. The chat room wanted to see some of Brian's photos. Brian, I, I don't know you haven't talked, maybe your mic doesn't work, but you could uh, like you could be like a coma patient. If you want to share photos, <laughs> blink twice. <laughs> I don't I don't think you'd be able to see my eyes. Uh, I've got pretty thick okay. glasses here, so <laughs> but uh, no, I've just been enjoying the show and uh, sitting back and watching. It's really uh, for me, I'm just starting like dipping my toe in the water of photography. And uh, seeing all your guys' work, I'm just like, yeah, I got a long way to go. I'm really enjoying what I'm doing, but uh, <laughs> certainly not at that level. Um, but I can try. Do you have any you want to share? Yeah, share two or three with us real quick. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see. People in the stream, bear with me because you are going to see what I'm doing here real quick. Let's see. This is the first time I've ever TD'd a show in this kind of format. All right, now I will do this. Hey, Chad. Hey. It's Chad Johnson back there. Uh, so recently I went to Disneyland, and I had some fun with my uh, T3i, my first DSLR. Let's see if I can get this all to work. Do you guys see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, I mean, I... Oh, now it's in a slideshow. Great. <laughs> um, I haven't messed around with uh, HDR stuff at all. I've only um, I've messed with some things in uh, Lightroom that Tony has showed me, and he's kind of the one that really um, got me. I've always been into photography, but uh, I started mostly as a videographer, and now I've gotten into photography a lot more. Um, <clears throat> and Tony's kind of helped me along with a lot of that stuff and, and watching your stuff too, Trey. Um, hold on. Uh, this is actually a photo that a friend took of, but I, um, I had fun in photo. Oh God, there's so many things in my, <laughs> 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 these, 
these <laughs> this is uh, I wasn't prepared uh, so I have some other things on my USB uh, but this was a photo that a friend of mine took and then I just photoshopped some shadows into it and had some fun with it that way um, the world yeah uh, let me get to <laughs> these aren't in any order either so I'm trying to get to my the ones uh, this one was at Disneyland I took it with my uh, little Canon point and shoot which I thought was gonna be enough was gonna make me happy but then uh, I started to play around with uh, Tony's T2i back in the day and I realized I had to get a DSLR and play with some of the it settings. It looks like you had a tripod. I didn't. Um, I was resting that on a guardrail that was uh, next to that ride. What about the other shots you showed on the inside of Star Tours? That was the same kind of situation. Let me see if I can go back to that. Um, this was Space Mountain. And uh, okay. where I am standing, there's a walkway. And I just held the camera on the uh, stable on the uh, the railing and tried to use that as kind of a makeshift um, yeah, tripod. You did a good job with it because I know that had to have been um, pretty long exposure. Yeah, it, it was. And I was trying to get, um, I took it right when the people were getting out and then the other people were just jumping in. So it worked out pretty good. And then I, you know, messed around a little bit in Lightroom to kind of make the colors pop a little bit more. Um, still kind of finding my way through that, but I'm really enjoying it. Um, <clears throat> really what I wanted to practice was, um, well, well, there's my girlfriend. We, we went to Disneyland. <laughs> um, I wanted to practice night shots and stuff and just like getting used to different exposures. And Tony's actually the one that gave me, um, uh, he called it a gateway drug lens, uh, <laughs> The 1.850 millimeter uh, lens that I like to use a lot. $104, Amazon.com. Yep. Well, he gave it to me. I bought him lunch twice and he gave it to me. <laughs> uh, Jeez. Uh, this guess, one was. I guess I should have bought him lunch in DC. Whoops. <laughs> uh, this one was Pirates of the Caribbean. And it was like you, I think, was it? Um, I forget. Uh, somebody was saying they had taken a picture on a boat. It's kind of the same situation. And I was going to say, I just went, I went to Disney World, which I guess the Pirates of the Caribbean is the same thing. And yeah, you're on a boat. And to get that shot, I don't know how you got that without, uh, well, even with a tripod, the boat's moving. <laughs> yeah. It, it, if you look at, you can't really tell through the screen, but down at the bottom, it's a little, um, a little blurry from the motion. But um, I, when I was in that ride, I was just playing around with the different ISO settings and shutter speeds to see what worked and just kind of messing around. Uh, like this one's really grainy cause I had the ISO all the way up, but I was just trying to get a shot of that. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to find my night shot that I did. Um, cause uh, those are the ones I like to do are landscape shots or, um, or nighttime shots. This one was the, at the Lego in downtown D Disney, um, with the big dragon and kind of got some lens flare there with the, the sun up in the corner. Um, <clears throat> so not, not too many adjustments. I mean, this one, I made some vibrance, uh, and saturation changes, but, and like a little bit of cropping, but still, still learning. <laughs> um, shoot. Oh, this is the, one of the ones I was talking about uh, nighttime shots. Um, I don't, I didn't like you, uh, who was it Scott who went to Disneyland, Disney world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I didn't have a tripod either. So I kind of had to, uh, move around and see what worked. And this was about mm, 10 minutes into moving around New Orleans square to try and find a good place, um, to rest my camera while I had the shutter open for a while. But, um, Yeah. I think you definitely have the composition down. Thank you. All your shots feel right. They feel balanced. Uh, except that one. Except that one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one was tough because I was trying to get maybe just the silhouette and then the the light in the background, but uh, still, some of the HDR stuff you guys do is absolutely incredible, and I'd like to get better at that. Um, yeah, that's what the well, flash. Keep it up, Brian. Um, remember, when you listen to Tony, only listen to um, 
half of what he says. It's up to you to choose which half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I remember you saying that before once to Leo too. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's my stuff. Thanks for uh, you know being interested. Sure, thank you for sharing it with us. Um, my dad brought me some ice cream here. Nice. I see your dad. Yeah. Hello. Oh. Hello, Trey's dad. Hi, Trey's dad. Hi, guys. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Dallas, do you want to share a discovery with us? Yes. Okay. Um, screen share. Diablo 3, I see it. Yeah, uh, that's our discovery. I, I'm going to play one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Are you going to be a wizard? Is that what you're going to play? Yeah. I'm the girl, so they made me be the wizard. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Before you be a monk. Yours, what what server are you guys going to be on? Do we know the server names or anything yet? Oh, I, I I don't know yet. I can't yeah. I can't even install because I have the, I have to go pick up a collector's edition. I didn't do digital downloads. So. But we will be roughly on the same time zone, so we'll be able to play all together. Yeah, I'll I'll message you our vent info later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think there's one new universal time zone, and it's Blizzard Central Time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, for my discovery, it's actually a photographer I've been aware of for a while, but I noticed he doesn't have very many followers at all on Google+. Plus. So um, mostly I've seen his work on DeviantArt and Flickr, uh, so I was happy to find him here. And um, probably pronouncing it wrong, Oleg Oprisko, um, but I, he's a, in the Ukraine, I think, um, and he shoots a medium format film. And I, I've always just really admired his pictures um, for like just their storytelling and the fact that it is film and uh, just like color and everything. Like um, he does have a live journal account where he posts, but it's not in any language I can read. So I don't know that it's much a, It's all Cyrillic. <laughs> so <laughs> Google Translate should fix you right up with that. Yeah, but. maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I've just, yeah, I've always just really enjoyed his work. Uh, interesting, interesting fact. You guys will notice that he's kind of like uh, pulled out a little bit, but he still has that really, as you guys can see in this frame right here, that really uh, um, dreamy bokeh effect. That is that is an effect of the uh, of medium format uh, cameras. Now, to get that effect on, on a digital without mm -hmm. resorting to the Brenzier effect, which is what it's meant to, uh, to emulate, you'd have to go with like a Hasselblad or something like that. But um, being able to get into medium format uh, film photography is uh, much less expensive up front, although you pay for it in film and development. So yeah, he has a variety of stuff and... Um... It's not. It's not really fashion either. Like the girls, it's. I. It's more like artistic portraits. Um, but like just moments like this, like with the birds flying in front, and the fact that this is a film photograph is pretty amazing. Cool. Thanks. Um, you know, everybody. It's hard to catch these names of these people, especially when we pull out all these crazy uh, <laughs> heroes that have names that sound like dolphins. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll plus mention all these people uh, in the uh, when I repost this when I repost this thing later. So, okay, all right, cool. Um, uh, Ron, do you have something for us? Sure do. I found this guy was kind of I like to take a look at a lot of uh, sort of <laughs> urban decay sort of shots and. Uh, you know, this kind of thing, these crazy destroyed either landscapes or buildings. Uh, and then seeing how you can sort of make them both look kind of ugly and beautiful at the same time. And there's a couple of Google Plus uh, tags. I think there's Urban Decay and Urban Explorer uh, that you can search for in Google Plus and get a lot of different people that, that post these sorts of photos. And some of them really are pretty amazing. They feel like they have a, a story behind them. But this is a guy named uh, Matthias Haker, H-A-K-E-R. Um, I think he's based in Germany. And he had a few that sort of caught my eye. The first one was was this shot and just the way the light is kind of coming into this destroyed building. Um, and and then as I was looking around, I think the thing that kind of sold it for me was was this shot of New York City, just because you see so many shots uh, of New York City from you know, a variety of vantage points. And for whatever reason, this one just kind of 
seemed to be a little bit different than what I'd seen before. You know, the combination of the smoke and the fog and the processing on it, not not going overboard with saturation, but still getting a, a really colorful shot that doesn't feel super saturated. So I really like that. Uh, and then just one more. Um, this is pretty fascinating, especially if you could look at and see the detail. It's just uh, it's a, a lighthouse that is partially covered with ice off in the distance, and then some of the, the foreground elements are just clumps of, of frozen uh, water as well coming in from the sea. And again, just wow. a nice combination of sort of subdued colors, but a good combination of things. And, uh, you know, it, it almost feels like it's desaturated, but then you realize there's, there's so much color in it that probably was actually saturation was added. So it was sort of an interesting kind of mix. But so, yeah, I, you know, he's got not a whole lot of stuff on Google Plus, actually, and he, he has very few followers, but you can click there to his website. He's got a lot more in, in a variety of different categories. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Verena, do you have one? I do. Um, yeah, hold on a second. I'll screen share here. There we go. Um, all right, can you guys see that? Yes. Excellent. Um, so <laughs> uh, his name is um, <laughs> Henki Quentoro or, or something like that. And I know I just butchered it, and I'm very sorry, Mr. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but I mean, you can just you can see his work is just breathtaking. Um, it, this this guy is from Indonesia. Um, I'm clicking on there it goes. Um, and he has this whole collection of black and white images that are breathtaking. Again and again, just incredible images. Mm -hmm. um, he has this. Um, you know, he's, he's seeing the light in a way that um, I think a lot of people don't see it. And so to, to have him, you know, working with mist and light and, and tonality, um, I think, I, I, you know, I spent hours when I first found his stuff just looking at his images and, and really appreciating them. Um, he's also a videographer, and, um, you know, so he, uh, um, I haven't seen any of his video work, but if it's, Anywhere near as good as his photography, um, you know, cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sorry? Do you know if this is primarily digital or, f or film or? You know what? I don't know. It doesn't, he, he doesn't say anything about that. Um, so I, I have no way of knowing. Wow. Still on the square crop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I do too. I have no idea what, it, you know, what camera he's working with, what lenses, nothing. But um, it's just whatever different. he's doing yeah. is jaw dropping. Yes, and that guy's cool. Um, hey, yeah. Scott, how about you, Scott Coupland? Sure. Uh, let's see this. There we go. See it? See yes. my screen? Okay, I'm just going to share one person, Brandon Kopp, K-O-P-P. -P. When I was in um, D.C. a month and a half ago, I took a bunch of shots of D.C., and somewhat impressed with my shots until someone told me about this guy's shots. <laughs> his were just uh, incredible. And I'll just show you a couple of these here um, at the state capitol. I mean, I, I just... Nice. And, and another thing I like about his shots is, you know, I walked those grounds trying to look for different vantage points, and I didn't see this. And that kind of, mm -hmm. you know, gives me room for improvement seeing stuff like that. And let me just see if there's a couple other ones that he has. This one. The one with the water down there? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'll put that full screen. Um, I guess that one's, that one's okay. Which one? You just, down here? That one, that one. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oof. <laughs> it's like yeah. yeah, it's great. It's too bad there's just construction. I would have probably <laughs> content or filled that out. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, they're great. They're excellent shots. And yeah, I'll just see if there's another one that stands out. Um, well, we'll do this one because it kind of has the same sky that my Eiffel Tower shot had. Just really, really pretty sky. So it's Brandon Kopp, B-R-A-N-D-O-N-K-O-P-P. -P -P. And he doesn't just shoot shots of DC. He's got um, lots of different stuff. But that was what Thanks, got my attention. Sure. 
Hey, Ron, you're still sharing your screen, by the way. Uh, so uh, before we say goodbye, uh, Dave, you had a few things you want to show us? Yeah, sure. Um, well, my Lightroom here. So on that same trip to DC, this was out with Scott and some other people. Um, this is the Freedom Wall down at the uh, World War II Memorial. Oh, I, shot, that's great. That's I shot really this as as two shots so I could get the sky and both the bottom here, and I comped them together. Um, this is actually the moon and Venus and Jupiter, I think, right up here, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of worked out cool, I thought. You have no idea how much work it took for us to get them to do that. <laughs> <laughs> And last week I got a macro lens, so I've started shooting some macros. Ooh. This is a, a wrench. <laughs> There's a Woody feeling the, feeling the love from the Mac. And, uh, there's just a coil that I thought looked like one of those X-Wing starfighters from Star Wars. This is a sunflower that I shot. On Saturday, it was a flower uh, from my wife's Mother's Day arrangement, and this is my my favorite macro so far. It's cool. That's I think you were just bragging that you got your wife flowers there. <laughs> 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 and these are all just like I just like lit them with an LED flashlight, and I actually shot at HDR. And... Cool. Thanks, Dave. Thanks yeah. for showing us those. All right. Hey, uh, Dallas, before we close, Dallas, there is a comment directed your way here from the YouTube live comments. You never know, you know, what kind of uh, pent up 12 year old angst will show up in YouTube live. <laughs> but this, this one is a good one. It says, I don't know if this is from Matt Kayser. Uh, I don't know if Dallas and Ed are looking at this comment stream, but if you are, then you should know that your dog is adorable. Yeah. <laughs> and adorable. Go to I is adorable. Well, thank you. Yes, she is. Yeah, let me see if I can get she it. She has her All own right. Facebook page, actually. Good. Well, we'll we'll close out the podcast with uh, your dog waving. Good. Can you hold up his paw to wave goodbye to everybody? Um, we went to go find her. She ran away. While they're looking, while they're looking, I just want to mention Twit Photo tomorrow. Uh, they have <laughs> Catherine Chalmers as the guest. I'm not sure if in studio or not, but. That should be a good show. Yes, that's at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. She will be in studio. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. And you can see um, Catherine and I and several other people. I think, Ron, you're going to be there uh, next week at the Google Plus Photographers Conference. We just figured out all the details of, of my photo walk. Um, and uh, that's going to be on Monday. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Okay, so here we go. Uh, thanks again, everybody. We will have the dog uh, wave goodbye. For everybody. <laughs> goodbye, Kodachrome. <laughs> and we'll see you next. The name is Kodachrome, right? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Code of the dog. <laughs> okay, bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Good Thank night. You.